Okay, so I want to start with a quote. I read this online. There are places where you can go and do like these write-in columnists that will answer your questions. And a woman wrote in and she said, I'm in a situation of when it rains, it pours. Nothing is going right in my life and I just can't handle it. What do you suggest I do? Now, I really want you to think about this. When was the last time that that's how you felt? When was the last time in your life you felt like, oh, when it rains, it pours? It's like the only news that I get is bad news. I mean, we all have seasons of life like that, right? And you think about all the, I mean, think about rains and pours, I and mean, you think about all the storms that life can blow, blow up into our lives, right? How many people have experienced the loss of a job, or how many people are dealing with health issues, or the death of someone they really care about and love, or betrayal by someone they trusted, or financial loss. You think about all the different things I could put on there that create storms in our lives, and we've all had to deal with storms that threaten to blow the roof off, right? We've all had times in our lives where this is the image that we would use to describe our boat. It feels like we are overwhelmed and we are going down and don't know what to do. One of the most amazing stories I heard about feeling overwhelmed is the story of this man. His name is, uh, is Tariq Cohen. So yeah, I know he's, he was a bear, but it's okay, his story is incredible. So Tariq Cohen, um, was, was a really, really good Chicago Bear for years. Uh, and he recently wrote a letter to himself. He's about 25 years old. He wrote a letter to himself when he was 17 years old saying, I want to prepare you for what's about to happen in your life. And you want to hear about a storm. You can go online and look up Tariq Cohen's letter to himself. And it is amazing. <sighs> This is a picture of him when he was younger with his two brothers. The brother on the right, his name is Dante. And when Tariq Cohen got into college and he got a scholarship and they got drafted by the Bears and all of his career started taking off, unfortunately for his other brothers, things went the other way. Dante started using drugs, then he started dealing drugs and selling drugs. And that is a very violent lifestyle. And one day, Tariq got a phone call saying that his brother had been in a gunfight and was shot in the head and paralyzed. And so he, he had to go and see his brother in the hospital, and eventually, not from the wound, but that brother at a young age passed away. And so he was only left with his other younger brother, Tyrell. And so this is a picture of Tyrell on the right in the white t-shirt. And Tyrell didn't do drugs, but he started messing around, getting in trouble, and then one day he, he and his buddy were out drunk driving, and they crashed their car at 2 in the morning, and he took off running in the woods. And, and so uh, Tariq got a phone call from his mom saying, hey, Tyrell never came home last night. And so then he found out more, and he's like, oh, it's no big deal. He's out hiding in the woods. He doesn't want to get arrested by the police and get a you know, drunk driving certif uh, you know, ticket. And so, um, but then he gets another phone call. In his attempt to get away, whether he was drunk and didn't know what he was doing or what, he, he, he came across a power substation and he climbed over the fence, maybe trying to hide, we don't know. And he touched something that electrocuted him and he died on the spot. And they found his body. And now all of a sudden, Tariq had to go and tell his niece, his two nieces, his four-year-old and six-year-old, that dad was never coming home again. And he writes about all of this in the letter to himself, telling him what's going to happen. And oh, by the way, if you're like, I, I watched football last year, didn't see him. Oh yeah, in the middle of that, he blew out his knee, tore his ACL, MCL, and fractured his tibial plateau in three places, and said, that was the easiest of what I had to deal with. Can you imagine this? I mean, that's overwhelmed. In just a few years, all of that happened. And in the letter, he said he, he, he was feeling, what's the point? When was the last time you asked the question, what's the point? When you felt so overwhelmed by what was going on in your life that you're like, I just don't even know why. That can be a really scary place to be, and you don't want to stay there. All of us, at times in our life, will probably go into that. I've certainly been there myself, and I'm sure most, if not all of you, have. So that's why we're in this series called Fear Less. 
And I told you at the start of the series, this is about learning how to turn the dial down on fear because don't, God doesn't want you to be afraid. 365 times in the Bible, God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. One for every day of the week. Do not be afraid. So today, don't be afraid. And he has an answer for this question. So how do you face an overwhelming challenge? Because they happen. So I want to ask you to open your program, and inside you'll find these notes. Can I ask you to get your notes out and grab a pen? There are some really important things I'm going to ask you to write down and underline and circle as we go through this. So I really want you to do this. And some of you, um, you're sitting here, and whenever I do a message like this, some of you, life's, life's good. You're like, man, everything's going good for me right now. And what I always say when I'm doing something like this is, first off, take notes, because someday your boat will... <laughs> the, the water will come over the sides for you. But the other thing is, think about somebody in your life who maybe is feeling overwhelmed. I bet you can think of at least one person who's feeling overwhelmed by what they're going through in life today. And maybe God has you here so that you can encourage them with what you learned today. So we're only going to talk about a couple of things today. And the first thing I want to say to you is embrace the gift of too much. And if you're struggling right now, that, you won't even want to write that down because that just doesn't sound like a nice thing. It's like... Uh, what? It doesn't feel like a gift. And I, I'm just asking you to hold, withhold judgment until I have a chance to explain this. Embrace the gift too much. There is a myth in Christianity that really, that really undermines our ability to experience God, and the myth is this. Here is the myth. God will never give you more than you can handle. I mean, if I were to ask you all, have you ever heard that phrase? God will never give more than you can handle, right? It's a very common myth. You can buy it on greeting cards that you can send to your friends when they're struggling. Isn't that encouraging? You can even tattoo it on your ribs. I hope that that was erasable ink. Because unfortunately, there is no verse in the Bible that says God will never give you more than you can handle. The Bible does say God will never let you be tempted beyond your ability to say no to the temptation, but he never says, oh, I'll never allow you to be in a situation that's beyond your ability to handle. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. When you read your Bible, you see over and over again God allowing people into circumstances that are beyond their ability to handle it. David the, this great king in Israel's history, as a young boy, is anointed to be the next king, and the current king doesn't really like that. And so he sends his army out to find and kill this young boy, this young high schooler, you know, high schooler in our world, who has to run for his life and hide in caves, and, 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 and this goes on for years and years, and he writes about how overwhelmed he feels again and again and again. It's like, this is your plan for me, God? You anoint me as king? I didn't ask for this, and now I have to run for my life, and I'm always being threatened? It's like, that doesn't feel like a gift. In the New Testament, it happened to Paul. Paul was, was dramatically rescued by God, and so then Paul is given this task of going around the Mediterranean Sea, telling everybody he can about Jesus, and in many of the places he goes, they are hostile to the message of Jesus, and he is beaten, he, beaten he's imprisoned, he has all of his property confiscated. At one point, they drag him out of the city, and they throw stones at him until they think he's dead. But he wasn't. He was just unconscious. And so he gets up and goes right back in that city. I mean, he's just fearless. But he talks about feeling overwhelmed in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. He says, we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, about the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Look at the overwhelmed words in here. Burdened beyond our strength. When was the last time that you felt burdened beyond your strength? You just don't have the strength to go through what you're going through. That's what he says. Despaired of life. Have you ever been that broken? You ever hit rock bottom where you despaired even of life? You ever felt like death would be the way out for you? Paul knows exactly what, we're all, what we all go through. He knew what it was like to feel so overwhelmed that he simply thought he was going to die. And then he turns all of this around in one sentence and he says this, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. We, we can't raise the dead. I don't know if you've ever tried, but it doesn't work. When I'm at a funeral, and no matter how much I pray for the dead person, they never come back. And I've done that. Maybe that's weird. I don't know. But it would sure freak everybody out if God did it, but I, I, it never works. When you see people in pain, it's like you're just so broken by it. It's like, God, give spirit back to this body. 
I don't have the ability to do it. Our God does. Our God, with just a word, can bring dead things back to life. And he says, this is why it happened, so that we, would, we go through overwhelming storms, not because he hates us, so, but so that we turn to him and rely on him, and then he is the one who raises us back up. We're the ones that are dead in this, in this example. We call this, in the, we call this in the spiritual world, we call this brokenness. Brokenness is a condition during which God allows circumstances to control our lives to the point where we must totally depend on him. That's what he's after. I've talked to you about this for years, remember? We, in, we um, if you're a parent, you want, you, when you have, hold that baby in your hands for the first moments of their life, they're completely dependent on you, right? Can't do a thing. You walk away, they die. Right? If you take a vacation for a week, you come back, you're going to prison because that baby's dead. That baby can't do anything without it. Completely dependent, and you want to raise them to the point where they're independent, right? In Christianity, it goes the other way. You and I are born and live most of our lives apart from Christ, independent. We make our decisions. So my life, my money, my future, my, dis- my career, my everything. And what God wants to do is move us to the point where we are dependent on him. Be- not because... He has some sick or twisted purpose. It's because he wants to show us how much he loves us. He wants to bring power into your life to change what you could never change. He wants to bring joy into your life so that despite the circumstances of what you're living through, you live with joy. He has this amazing plan for you, and it only happens when we rely on him. That's why Paul said this. You know what? All of that All of these overwhelming storms in my life were to make me rely not on myself, but on God, and he's the one who raises the dead. So, have you ever reached that point of spiritual brokenness where you you said, "I, I, I surrender, I surrender, I can't do it. There's nothing I can do. For me, it happened in 1995. I've talked about it earlier in the year in, in the context of hearing from God, but I'll tell you it from this side that different side today. I was very, very arrogant when I was young. So confident in myself. I lived by the motto, if it was to, if it was to be, it was up to me. That's how I lived my life. And so it was always about me doing everything, doing more, controlling things, and it doesn't work. And eventually, I encountered something that overwhelmed me. It was 1995. I was working full-time at a church in Madison. I had five weddings that summer. I was building a house on the side, and it was the second hottest summer in Wisconsin history in 1995. So every single thing, and that's just some of what was going wrong in my life. It was like everything that could go bad went bad. And one night I was alone with God, or I was alone, and I cried out to God, and I said to him, God, why is this happening? Why have you allowed me to lose control? And that's how I felt. I felt like I'd lost control. You ever felt that way? Like life is just out of control, out of your control? And then, I don't know how this is gonna come across to you. I'm only gonna tell you what my experience was. You'd make your own decision, but I heard from God that night in that moment when I asked that question. I've described it this way in the past. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like my mind went blank, which anyone who knows me knows my mind is never blank, but uh, it was blank. It was like a black screen. And in that moment, what I heard in my mind was, you never had control to begin with. Control was always an illusion. I heard it as clear as if someone had stepped up to me and said it to me, and I was all alone. And then I had an image in my mind, in that, after hearing those words, I had an image in my mind of a body on the ground with no bones in it. You know what a body on, with no bones does? Absolutely nothing. And then I heard, again, this is you without me. Now, you judge whatever you want. I promise I was not using hallucinogenics. I had nothing in my system except probably chocolate. But all of a sudden, I had this amazing encounter with God, and it came at the moment of brokenness. It was the turning point in my life, spiritually. Because it forced me to, no, I knew it was true, I knew it. it. It moved me from relying on myself, which gets, was getting me bitter, to relying on God, which got me better. That's your choice. Some of you are in overwhelming storms and you are, you've got your bucket. You just keep going. Yep, you've, the water is way over the sides. You're going down, but you, you're standing there and all of us are looking at you going, really, you got this? Yeah, you got it. 
You're just going to keep bailing. Don't worry, it's you. If it's to be, it's up to me. You're going to go down. You can't. The two things God needed me to learn to say that night that changed my life were, I am not in control, and God, I need you. How easy are those words for you to say? God, I'm not in control. And there's never a moment in my life where I don't need you. How easy are those words for you to say? So just a quick question to ask. I want you to think about this. Am I relying on God? Well, if you are, do you feel a lot of peace today? Hope? Do you feel really optimistic about your future? Or are you relying on yourself? Well, if you are, then you're gonna feel worried and anxious and stressed. Which list best defines where you're at today? Which list do you see more of? So the first thing we do is we embrace the gift of too much, which is designed to bring us to the point where we depend upon God. Now, I'm gonna ask you to jump down on your notes to, to point number three, and this is the only other thing we're gonna talk about today is what has to happen is once you reach that point of brokenness is that you have to learn how to give things to God. This is what you have to learn. You have to learn how to give things to God. If you follow Peniel on Facebook, we have a Facebook page, you can look us up. I I read something as I was prepping this week, I loved it so much, I immediately went on Peniel and I put it up here. Martin Luther said, the sin underneath all our sins is to trust the lie of the serpent that we cannot trust the love and grace of Christ and we must take matters into our own hands. That was the slogan, my my unofficial slogan for most of the first half of my life. If it's to be, it's up to me. I must fix things myself. I must take matters into my own hands. And when my life is a mess today, it's because I slip right back into that. But there's a different way you can go. A couple of weeks ago, I was telling you this story about one of my favorite stories about this this king in the Old Testament who one day uh, got a report that there were... there was an army coming against him, and it wasn't one army, it was three. Three nations had joined together to say, "Let's let's go destroy Israel. Won't that be fun? So they got their armies together, and it was a vast army, and they started marching towards um, the capital, and the king was like, we we got no hope here. Talk about overwhelming. And so he does this amazing prayer, and I love the prayer he prays. He said, oh, our God, will you not judge them? We have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. I love the humility and brokenness of that prayer, right? That's what we're talking about, spiritual brokenness. Any arrogance in that, those words? Any, any words from him in that, those sentences that say, we got this, God, watch what we'll do for you? No, it's the opposite, right? It's complete dependence on God. We are gonna trust you or this is over. And I love what God does. So the rest of the story is amazing. God hears their humble prayer and he sends a prophet with a message. And the first words of the prophet are... Do not be afraid. It's God's constant message to you. Not be afraid. I will be with you. I will take care of you. I will strengthen you. And he says, you're not even going to have to fight. You watch. Tomorrow go out, and you're going to go out, and you just watch what I do. Now, isn't, now, just think about that. If you were one of the nation of Israel, and there's a huge army coming towards you, you're going to die. You know you're gonna be, t- you're gonna be killed, your, your people you love are gonna be killed, you're gonna be taken into captivity, everything you own is gonna be taken by somebody else tomorrow. And all of a sudden, a prophet stands up and says, hey, God's got a message for y'all, don't be afraid. Tomorrow, God will take care of this whole thing for you. How do you sleep that night? Do you believe him? Do you sleep peacefully? Or maybe a little bit anxious and worried because nothing's actually happened yet, right? How do you feel? How do you sleep? What happens to you? Well, the next day the king gets up and he gets the army out and he does something incredible. If you know the story, he puts, he says, you know what, if God's gonna do this, let's, let's really believe that God's gonna do it. He said, choir members, choir members come forward. And he calls all the choir members forward and he puts them in the front of the army. So just think if you're like, yeah, uh, I wanna be in the choir. I don't want to be in the army. I'm going to be in the choir, and I'll, I'll be in the back, and just singing. You guys go battle. I'm just like, all of a sudden, you're like, I'm a choir member. Choir members don't go first, and the, he puts them in front of the army to march out to do battle. And 
God gives them incredible victory, and there's more to that I'll show you in a minute. But in this model, in this prayer is a model for us when we feel overwhelmed, and here are the elements that are so important that you learn. First, you admit to God, I can't. I can't. That's what he meant when he said, I have no power. I have no power. Flip your notes over on the back. Look at the bottom. It says, things I need to hand over to God. Are, are there, is there anything in your family that you need to hand over to God? Anything in your job or your career or your finances or your personal habits? Maybe some addiction or struggle that only you know about? Anything in a relationship that you need to hand over to God? It's, it's really getting comfortable with these words. God, I have no power to. And I made a list. I made my list this week of things that I have no power to. And I added a big one this week. It's like, I have no power over this, God. I am not in control. What would you put on your list? Second, you tell God, I need you. And I love how he prayed it in the, in the, the king prayed, my eyes are upon you. I've been using that phrase this week. God, I'm powerless here, but you know what? I am watching you. My eyes are upon you. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. I read a quote about this this last week from another famous author named C.S. Lewis. You ever read anything by C.S. Lewis? Oh, brilliant, brilliant Christian. He said this. It's a poor thing to strike our colors to God when the ship is going down under us. You know what striking your colors means? It was an old naval warfare thing. If two ships were out at the ocean and they came up and they were enemy and they started fighting, if this one was all of a sudden taking on lots of water and they were clearly defeated, they would drop their flag. It meant to strike their colors and it was a sign of surrender. If you struck your colors, it was like, I quit. I, I, you win. You win. So he's saying it's a poor thing for us to surrender to God when our ship is going down. And that's when we do it, right? That's, that is us. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it until all of a sudden we are overwhelmed, can't do anything else. The ship is going down. We're like, help God. We only strike our colors when we're about to go under. He says, a poor thing to do that. He said, a poor thing to come to him as a last resort to offer up our own when it's no longer worth even keeping. <laughs> if God were proud, he would hardly have us on such terms. But he is not proud. And look at this next sentence. He will have us, even though we have shown that we prefer everything else to him. And come to him because there's nothing better now to be had. Isn't that profound? Have you ever read the ending of the story of the prodigal son? The boy ruins his life. Ruins his life with every selfish decision he makes. And finally, when he has nothing left, he's destroyed his life by his wrong choices. He turns back to God in the story, the father is God. And what does the father do? He runs to the son. He restores the son. He showers grace upon the son. He forgives the son. He throws a banquet for the son. He puts a robe on the son. He puts rings on the son. He restores the son. That's what our God is like. Even if the only time you turn to him is when your ship is literally about to go under, the grace and love of this God is so unstoppable that even then he's thrilled to have you. That's what our God is like. It's incredible. So I admit to him, I can't, God, I'm powerless. I tell him, I need you. Even if my ship is about to go down. I really want you to think about what areas of your life do you really need to strike your flag to God, surrender to God. And then you focus on what he's promised you, which has been my, my theme in this whole series, because the antidote to your fear is what God has promised you. Did you know that? If you want to live without fear in this world, you have to know what he's promised. What has God said in the Bible? I will. I will. If you know what he will do, that's a guarantee. You may not have experienced yet, but it's a guarantee. So I put a website on the back at the bottom that you can go to that will give you verses that you can look up that will have promises of God. I know it's a little bit long, you know, long to type in, but it's just critical. I, I use this all the time. I thought, you know, I, I, should, I should explain how I do this. So um, if I'm being really honest with you, I didn't know if Peniel was going to survive COVID. I've never talked about this. But a lot of churches did not survive COVID. So all of a sudden, churches that 
were barely hanging on, couldn't have services around the country, and a lot of them just shut their doors forever. I had never saw the latest or final statistics, but it was a lot that just went under and never came back. And so I truthfully was worried about it. So worry is always a sign that you are trying to control something that's God's alone to control. How much control do I have about God building a church? Some of you are like, well, you might have a lot. I do not have a lot, I promise you. There is nobody's house I came to to wake you up to come to church today, right? Nobody. I don't control that. I don't control whether anyone wants to come to church. And so, one is, is, you know, after, you know, initially when COVID hit, I would stand here in front of a camera alone and record a message and we put it on the website so at least people could have services. And then when we finally could start meeting again t- together, uh, it, it mask under the, you know, had to wear a mask and come, you know, there were times that we'd have 10, 12 people in the whole room and it's was like, oh, 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 is this ever gonna, what's gonna happen? Are we gonna make it? And, a, and about a month ago, I was really worried about it and all of a sudden I, I, I caught myself and I'm like, I, I, see, I fall back into this, the lie that I, if it's to be, it's up to me. It's like, you make yourself miserable when you do that. So I'm like, well, what's the promise God has made? Well, I know. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. By the way, remember what I said are the two words you look for in the Bible? Those two words. I will. That's a promise. It's his promise. So I started about five or six weeks ago, it was probably about that time frame, just praying that back. It's like, every time I was worried about it, hey, is this thing gonna make it? I don't know. But you promised this, Jesus. You said you will build your church, so can't wait to see what you do. Can't wait to see what you do. Not mine, I don't do it. I'm not in control, I need you, you promised this. Let's see what you do with your I will. Now, I know that we're really close to summer now, so I mean, I know that it's like you're looking around and you're like, well, maybe you won't. But like a few weeks after that, we had Easter and we almost had back to normal numbers again. For the next few weeks, it was incredible. And for those of you watching online, you don't have any clue how many are here anyway. So we never turned the camera around. So, but it was just, it was just like, God, he must have just laughed. <laughs> I, what I picture God doing in heaven when I finally get to that point of brokenness is God goes, finally, this guy is so stubborn. If he would just ask six months ago, I'd have done it then. But no, he's got to think he's in control. He's got to think he's in control until you finally get to that point of brokenness where you're like, I'm not in control, God, I just need you. Would you fulfill your promise to do what you can do? And then in faith, you thank him that he is working. That's the last thing. Before you see it, and that's what I love about that story about the king. Get this, so again, so you're the, you're, the, you're the king and you put your choir in front of your army. Now, if God isn't keeping his promise, who dies first in this battle, right? Every choir member, they're all gone. They don't even have a sword. They're there to sing. And here's what happens in the story. So that takes some faith to do it, right? Other th- it's either faith or you hate everybody in the choir. One of those two things is true, right? You either hate everybody in the choir or you really believe that God's about to do what he promised. And look at what it says in Second Chronicles 20. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise. Now what were they praising God for? Had he done anything yet? Nothing, not a thing, but he had made a promise to them. He promised, hey, he said, I'm going to take care of you guys. You won't have to see it. And so at the very moment he, they begin to sing, you know what God, it says in the Bible, God showed up in the enemy armies. He made them turn and start fighting each other. They wipe each other out. The, the choir comes up over the hill and they're like, oh my goodness, the battle scene is carnage. Everyone's gone. And they spend three days looting the entire camp. There's so much stuff. They can't carry it all back in one day, two days, three days. And they change the name of the valley where all this happens to the valley of blessing because that's what God wants to do in your life God wants to bring blessing into your life his plan for you is better than your plan for you and you'll only experience that on the day that you give up control and surrender control to the God of love if I were to ask you do you know who that woman is If you look at the hole and you look at the little trap door on the left, maybe it gives you a clue. Some of you know the name Corey Ten Boom. 
She was a part of the Dutch resistance in World War II when the Nazis invaded her country. She was a part of helping to hide Jews because she didn't want them slaughtered just because they were Jews. So she and her family protected them until one day the Nazis found out about them. They came to the house, they arrested Corey and her dad and well, a bunch of family members, but three of them were then sent. Corey, um, her dad and her sister were sent to Ravensbrück. So if you know anything about World War II history, you're talking about one of the worst Nazi concentration camps. There was a phrase she said that absolutely saved her when she was there. When she was younger, she asked her dad a big question, and her dad was quiet for a moment. They were on a train together, and he had a really big bag, and she was a little girl. And he didn't answer until the train came to a stop, and he said, would you carry my bag? And she's a little girl, she, she couldn't pick it up. She said, Dad, I can't carry this, it's too heavy for me to carry. And, and he said to her, Corey, I want you to know, there are things in life that we cannot carry, or, listen to this, or we are not ready to carry them yet. On those days, we need to let our Father carry them for us. Can you imagine how many things were too heavy for her in the concentration camps? And so her phrase, every time she felt overwhelmed, was this, Father, this is too heavy, I can't carry it. In what area of your life might God be trying to get you to say those words? Father, this is too heavy, I can't carry it. What does he need to start caring for you? This is what I want you to know. Our God is an amazing God of grace and love. He is ready to start carrying some things for you. It's why his command to you constantly is do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. So if I were to ask you, what is God, if I were to ask you that question, some of you, without hesitation, you know what you'd put down. Right? You've got something painful from your past. You've got something in your life right now that is so stressful to you and scary to you. You don't know how you're going to make it through. You don't know how to carry it. And God brought you in here today so I could tell you, you don't have to carry it. You can say, I can't carry this, God. Way too heavy for me. I need you. And you promised that you will help me, strengthen me, be with me, so... Before I see how you're going to move this big thing, thank you. Thank you that you'll carry this for me. Follow those four steps. I strongly encourage you to write them out. Then put them somewhere where you don't forget them. And then every time you're worried, go right back through that again. This is too heavy for me. I'm giving it to you. You carry it, God. Let me have you bow your heads as we finish today. Some of you who are just here watching online are just exploring your faith with us and what I want you to know is that you are more loved than I could ever put into words. There's never a moment of your life when he hasn't been pursuing you because he wants you to bring you into a life that you get to experience his power and joy. He wants to be a part of changing things that you could never change. And it all begins with a simple step of faith. The Bible says that because Christ came into the world for a specific purpose, he allowed himself to be hung on a cross to die for all the unloving things we've brought into this world, everything. He paid it all. And then he rose again. And if you'll let him, Jesus Christ will come into your life and forgive you and begin the work inside of you of changing you. And part of it means that he will now be your partner to go with you everywhere you go. And you will never walk away from him again, ever. He will always be with you. And if you want that kind of new relationship with God, it doesn't come because of a religious ceremony or service. It comes because you step out in faith and ask for it. And you ask and say something like this in your heart to him. Say, Jesus, I've certainly brought unloving things into this world, and I'm sorry. I need you. I'm asking you today to forgive me. 
to give me your promised gift of eternal life. I'll make your home inside of me today so that I can get to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we finish, can I ask you all to take the little connection card out of your program? Even if you're a regular tender, just put your name down. Let us know that you were here, but maybe you prayed and asked for his gift of forgiveness or renewed your commitment. Just let us know about that. If you have something that is overwhelming you, you can put it down here on the prayer request section. And we have a team of people that will pray for you. Uh, if you just, you don't want to specify what it is, just say, you could just say, you know, a silent prayer request or something like that. And we will pray. You don't have to put the details down. And then just drop this in one of the two offering boxes back on the back wall where you came in. Thanks so much for coming. Hope you can come back again next week.